Hello, welcome to a special Q&A recording of 76 Days, one of the 50 official selection titles at the 45th Toronto International Film Festival. This film plays as part of TIFF Docs, which is generously supported by a and &E Indie Films. My name is Tom Powers, and I'm TIFF's documentary programmer, celebrating my 15th year at the festival. I'm honored to be here with one of the film's three directors, Hao Wu, who's joining me from Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you to our audience for being part of TIFF during these unprecedented times. We are grateful for your support to keep TIFF going for years to come. This film is eligible for the People's Choice Award. You can vote for your favorite films at tiff.net slash vote. Now, how, uh, let's get into it. Um, these days you're based in the United States, but you grew up in China and you've made four previous documentaries in China. Your most recent film is on Netflix. It's called All in My Family. That's a personal story about you trying to explain being a gay parent to your extended family in China. And a memorable character in that film is your grandfather. Um, and I know that this film, current film, 76 Days, kind of got started because you were making another trip to visit your grandfather in January. Can you explain the background to, to how 76 Days got started? Yeah, um, thanks, Tom, for uh, inviting me here. So um, usually when I do make documentary films, I tend to focus on character-driven stories. I usually shy away from very newsy topics uh, because I always wonder what else can I provide to the uh, to a to a topic that's already being extensively covered in the news? But with seven, 76 days, the whole journey, uh, filmmaking journey, has been extremely personal. So I flew back to China on January 23rd uh, to visit my family to spend Chinese New Year's with them. That was the day when Wuhan was put under lockdown. And now you were in Shanghai uh, visiting your family, am I right? That's correct. So um, my spouse and I were supposed to take my two ki little kids to visit my family uh, in Shanghai because both my parents, uh, you know, were diagnosed with cancer last year. So I wanted to um, spend as much time with them as possible, especially being the younger ones. Uh, but then one day before our departure, we heard about this lockdown. So we had a very agonizing time deciding whether to go back or not, especially taking um, our kids. Uh, because it's just like incredulous. It starts happening in China back in 2003. We thought the government couldn't have possibly hide, you know, hide any facts about the severity of the, the outbreak in Wuhan. But in the end, we decided to play it safe. So I flew back to Shanghai myself, um, spending the uh, Chinese New Year holiday with my family. Uh, it was a quite strange experience because Shanghai is the largest city in China. Usually during Chinese New Year, it's extremely festive with a lot of people doing shopping, going to the movies. But then during that week in Shanghai, it was completely shut down. There was very few people on the street. It was like a zombie apocalypse movie set. So, and then after I flew back to China, um, to the US, um, my grandfather was diagnosed with late stage liver cancer and he passed away really quickly in early March. And I couldn't go to visit him, to say goodbye to him because of COVID, because of the travel restrictions. Uh, so it was all a very um, personal experience. So when American Network uh, approached me to ask me if I wanted to develop a feature uh, documentary about the pandemic, I just jumped on board. But that was just like the start of another complicated journey. <laughs> uh, and so talk about how you join forces with your two co-directors in Wuhan. I started researching the topic for this American network in late February. Uh, so I, because in the beginning, in, at that time, that seems so long ago now, um, pan, the pandemic was still um, pretty limited to China and some surrounding Asian countries. Um, and uh, I just, for me, I was like the rest of the China, um, the country of China, like everybody else, I was under a lot of confusion and frustration and, and anger as well. Just how could this have happened? Um, so I was spending a lot of time reaching out to reporters and filmmakers on the ground uh, to understand what the situation was like and 
closely following the media reporting, especially social media. And so I found my co-directors that way because their footage really moved me and shook me and brought me so up close and personal to the front line. Um, but then, you know, because of the geopolitical evolution um, that the, the, the increasing, you know, fights between U.S. and China uh, uh, over this pandemic. And my co-director very quickly said, uh, oh, we couldn't possibly collaborate with American network to work on a film because we don't know how, where you're going to take the story, what, whether you're going to say anything that's going to be um, censored by the, by the government in China. So they stopped collaborating with me. And then in late March, I think the, um, you know, the pandemic in mid March, it really the pandemic came to New York. So I was started filming in New York. And then that's when it hit me. It's like the same story I heard, I, 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 I saw in Wuhan what's happening again in New York. So uh, the, initially your co-directors were uncertain about uh, uh, collaborating with you, uh, then you overcame that. Can you uh, describe how that collaboration then continued? Yeah, I mean, it was a long journey. So in late March, the American network kind of dropped the project I was developing for them. So my partner and my two kids had driven down to Atlanta to stay with my in-laws to escape New York, the epicenter, the US epicenter of the pandemic at that time. So in early April, since um, I had nothing else to do in New York, I just drove down to Atlanta and quarantined in the basement for two weeks. Uh, during that time, I was by myself. Um, I had you know, a lot of wine to drink and I had nothing else to do. So I started editing, playing around with the footage from the two filmmakers I, I, I had been in touch with. And I, I don't know whether because the quarantine or because the wine, I found myself constantly in tears because watching them experience the pandem pandemic on the front line really moved me. And also that was uh, soon after the passing of my grandfather. So I, I guess I needed something to hold myself together, to fo focus my energy. So I started editing. Uh, even though the filmmaker said we could not work with you. So I started editing and got back in touch with them to say, can you please let me work, uh, work on this film as an individual filmmaker, not working for any American media companies. So they still say no, no, but I keep on pushing forward. But once I have had, had edited um, a complete rough cut, I showed it to them. That's when they agreed to collaborate with me because they could see where I was taking the film. Um, they could see I, like them, I was paying a lot more attention to the individual human stories during this pandemic. Can you talk about their ability to get access to these stories? Uh, you know, in the West, we, you know, hear a lot about how, the difficulties of filming in China. Yes, I think it's not just difficulty filming in China, because when I was trying to film in the U.S., um, in New York, to going to the hospital, it was extremely, extremely difficult. I think it, it would be more difficult here due to the HIPAA laws, right, in the U.S. Uh, so the, the, my two collaborators, Wei Shi Chen, he's a video reporter for Esquire China. So he was embedded with a medical team supporting a hospital in Wuhan. So he was filming there. He actually edited um, out a short, a 30-minute short, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's shown on, online in China. Uh, my other collaborator, Anonymous, um, he's a local photo journalist and working for a local publication. So he was there just taking photos, but then he realized, and very early on, photos could not do this justice. So he started filming for the first time uh, with his 5D, Canon 5D. Um, can you talk about the quality of image making that uh, that these two cinematographers and co-directors uh, captured? Because I found myself when I first watched the film, you know, pausing just to look at some of those images that you know stand alone as as still images. It makes sense when you say that you know one of your collaborators is by training a, a still photographer. Absolutely, yeah. I think uh, Wei Shi Wei Shi and has done some short documentaries. So for him, it's more about the action, following the characters, uh, very handheld style, uh, getting us very close to what's happening uh, on the scene. 
but with anonymous because as you said he was trained as a still photographer so he was really sensitive to composition to the shots so that's what initially drew me to his footage is that not only was he able to um, be there with the characters and also he captured these amazing images uh, and also because the anonymous was a local reporter so he he knew a lot of the hospitals quite well so he was getting some great access to be able to talk to the local patients the local doctors um you know uh in North America, exposure to China and documentaries from China still remains very limited. And, uh, you know, North American media is often you know, presenting China as a monolith. Uh, you know, it's a billion people, but, you know, we rarely get to see individuals. And I think something that really stood out to me is the concentration on, on individuals in this film. Um, I wonder if you can, you know, talk about, you know, the the effort you've made in this film and throughout your work to you know, to try to be you know, making films for uh, about China that extend to international audiences. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in China, like you mentioned earlier, and I moved to the U.S. when I was twenty. So, um, you know, I was able in the U.S. I was able to um, form a queer family, and, you know, have kids and and switch careers. So, but right now I travel quite frequently between these two countries, these two cultures. So for me, sometimes when I think about it, it's almost like China is like my parents and US is like my spouse. You know, a lot of times I see them get into fights. I'm like, can we just all get along? Can we just take a step back? Uh, obviously there are certain issues um, that's fundamentally different between these two systems. But on a lot of other things, I'm always like, because I could see a lot of debates from both perspectives. Uh, so sometimes I get frustrated um, with uh, the, the, the instinct um, jump to portray everything as black and white, to see everything as monolithic. So in, through my work, I, like, you know, through all, all of my films, I always try to focus on the human stories because I try to remind the viewers, uh, despite our differences on many, many other issues, we're still human beings. We still have we still get, have fears. We still need to hold on to something, feel connected when we are isolated, when, when we are scared, and we still want to be loved. So that has been a common thread in my filmmaking, and that's what I'm trying to do, I think, with the latest film, 76 Days. Um, I want to ask you about Jean Shen, who's a producer on this film. She has a long career, both producing and editing films. She's been part of many films that have played at uh, TIFF before, but she's she's a figure who's well known within a documentary community, but is not often in the public. And so, I wonder if you can uh, talk about you know what Jean Shen has meant to your career. I always say Jean has been a fairy god sister uh, for me. I, I, when I was making my feature lens documentary, The Road to Fame, I moved from Beijing to New York to finish that film. And I approached Jean and tried to ask for her help to help me edit that film. And she was pretty reluctant. It took me a while to, uh, to befriend her and convince her to, to help me. Uh, ever since then, every single film of mine, uh, sh she helped edit and she also EP'd most of them. And uh, I just learned how to edit uh, from her. With this current film, back in April, when I was just playing with the footage, when I first started assembly a few scenes, I sent it over to, to Jean. I was like, Jean, I didn't know whether I had a film or not. What do you think? She immediately wrote back after watching them. She said, I cried, so you have a film. And so we've been discussing all along in terms of how to, you know, uh, how to finish editing the film, how to take this film out to the world along this entire process. So I'm really grateful for Jean's participation. Hmm. Um, so, you know, uh, we're recording this uh, in August, uh, just a little bit before the film festival. Um, as of this moment, uh, the film is still an independent film. You're in the process of looking for uh, distribution. Um, can you say anything more about that process or what your hopes are for the film? Uh, right now, TIFF audiences are the first people to see this film. Where do you hope it goes from here? 
I'm just feeling extremely, extremely lucky I'm able to finish this film and actually premiere this film because for a long time when I was editing, I didn't know whether my co-directors would ultimately license the footage to me, agree to collaborate and let me finish this film. So um, I'm happy with whatever comes. Um, but in the meantime, yes, we have started exploring distribution, but distribution for this film, I think would be a little bit more difficult because COVID is such a global phenomenon. A lot of the broadcast networks or streaming platforms already have some films in production. So whether they will be able to or want to take another film uh, onto their slate, that's a big unknown for us at this point. But regardless, I'm really happy um, this is going to go out into the world at TIFF. And we have a few festivals lined up already, at least in the U.S. in, in, in the fall. Uh, well, I think that once this film gets seen, uh, there's going to be a lot of attention for it, and it's going to go very far. We're really proud to start the journey for this film. Thank you again, Hao, for being with us. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, TIFF audience.